Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Introduction to Machine Learning uh, Workshop with Scikit-Learn. And my name is Yash, and thank you all for joining us today. So before we get started, uh, we're going to be using the Intro to ML Python notebook that's at this GitHub repository. So if you could please uh, download this, uh, download these two files from the repository, that would be awesome. And it'll help you follow along when I go through this workshop. And for those of you all who are live right now, this link is in the chat. So you can open up this Python notebook with Jupyter Notebook and um, follow along. And it has all the packages installed and like imported. And um, the CSV file is in the repository as well. OK. All right, uh, just before we begin, uh, for those of you all in the chat, uh, can you let me know like what your like, uh, can you let me know what your background with machine learning is? Like, have you have you um, done some classes in it? Are you a total beginner or are you an intermediate? Um, so what's your background like? All right. So yeah, let's just get started. So for our agenda for today, we have two sections. So we're gonna we're gonna start off with um, just a theory. And cool. Um, there, yeah, one of our attendees has some relevant background. And that's perfect. So we're gonna start off with just a brief overview of what machine learning is. We're gonna be going over the two main categories, which is supervised and unsupervised learning. And uh, we're gonna be going through some of the main um, tasks that you have within a machine learning, which are clustering, classification, and regression. And after we define these and go over these in depth, we're going to talk about, um, we're gonna go more in depth into classification, regression and clustering using some demos on a Pokemon data set. And this is where the Python notebook will come in handy because, uh, because all of the demos are in that notebook with, um, uh, with the Pokedex CSV and everything. Okay, so let's start off. So what is machine learning actually? So machine learning is a, is a buzzword right now but it essentially just means that um, we wanna teach computers how to learn and act without being explicitly programmed. And we wanna develop functions that can find patterns within data and predict this on unseen data. So we can feed it in some data and the, the machine learning algorithm will, uh, will learn, grow and fit the data and that it can dynamically change and, um, and work on other unseen data. So this is a, this, although this is like a, um, Although this is like a buzzard right now and not too many people know what it means, it's common in, in many industries right now. And um, it's actually uh, with the scikit-learn package, using machine learning is actually really, it's, it's pretty straightforward, but um, understanding the, the background behind these algorithms is, is difficult. And that's what, um, that's what all the classes in data science will, um, that's what a lot of the upper division classes in data science go more in depth into. So yeah, so machine learning algorithms will be dynamic and they learn, predict and improve over time. And they deal with different types of data. So they'll deal with numbers and then there's also text classification and then there's image and uh, time series. So machine learning models are very dynamic and adaptable. And um, yeah, that's the cool thing about them. They're, they, they can change, um, they're very dynamic, they can change and improve over time. So now we'll go over the first umbrella of machine learning, which is called supervised learning. And this is when you use a training set, which has the outputs in it to determine the predictive model. So this training set is actually labeled with the desired output. And um, when you have this, this training data set, it has the inputs and outputs. And then what happens is you input this raw data and then you split your data into a, a, a training uh, a training part and then a testing part. And then you train and then you test it based on, um, so if you fit it based on the training data and then you test it on your testing data and then you can compare your testing data to what you actually predicted to see how accurate your model actually was. So the, the main thing about supervised learning that draws it apart from unsupervised learning is that you know what the output should be and that will tell you what the like accuracy of your model is and like what, what the precision is. And within supervised learning, you have two major categories of tasks. So these task categories are classification. 
And classification is uh, when you categorize data into binary, which means uh, just two classes or multiple classes. So this means several different classes. And um, this, yeah, this could be, this could be uh, categorizing, um, this would be categorizing some piece, uh, some picture. So if you take a picture of something, this could be categorizing an item as, uh, as food or water, and that would be, uh, or food or drink, and that would be binary. And if you wanted to talk about multiple classes, you could do a hierarchical relationship and you could think about um, different types of food within that or different types of uh, beverages. So that would be a multi, this would be a multiple class classification model. And then you also have regression. And regression is talked about in a lot of statistics classes because it's very numerical based. And what this aims to do is it aims to find some relationship between an independent variable or an explanatory variable and um, some uh, dependent variable. And uh, the dependent variable is generally going to be um, continuous. So it's gonna be numerical. And that's why you can fit, um, you could fit either a line into it, which is when it's linear regression, or if it's a non-linear regression, you could fit a non-linear model to it. So, and some examples of regression would be if you're predicting the price of a house based on um, the number of beds in the house. So we would expect the number, we would expect the price of the house to increase when there are more, more bedrooms in the house. So we could draw a regression model based on that. And we'll go deeper into these models as well. So this is just a brief overview. Okay, so next up we have unsupervised learning. So the key difference that is uh, between unsupervised and supervised is whether the data set you train on is, um, or whether the data set that you feed into the algorithm is labeled or unlabeled. So in unsupervised learning, your data set is unlabeled. So you do not know the correct outputs. And uh, the algorithm will just, so the, these algorithms are often more complex. And these ones are the ones that will dynamically learn over time and improve themselves. And um, within, uh, within unsupervised learning, we have um, two, we have more categories, but the more common categories are clustering and anomaly, anomaly detection. So clustering is dynamically discovering groups within data. And this could be used when uh, this will be used when you have geographical data and you want to find clusters or uh, regions where people have the same like activity, activity preferences, like on Facebook or something. <clears throat> and then you could also use anomaly detection with unsupervised learning. And this is, um, this is where you identify unusual or extreme data, data points. So you could make groups within your data and the points that, are, that don't belong in any group could be uh, seen as extreme or unusual. And this is often used in um, diagnosing credit card fraud. So if you have um, un any unusual payments, that, would, that could show up as like an unusual data point. Um, if, if your credit card company does anomaly detection, they might be able to see that um, this purchase is likely fraudulent because it does not categorize into um, any cluster of your activity. So um, it would probably be, it, it could be flagged as, uh, as a fraudulent purchase. Okay. And uh, yeah, so now we'll be going deeper into the specific tasks. So the first task is classification. And this is, this is used with um, supervised machine learning techniques. So there are different categories, there's different types of classification, as we said earlier. So there's binary classification and um, the canonical example is identifying spam emails versus not spam emails. And uh, this is a cool piece of trivia, like not spam emails, they're, they're called ham emails. So this is like spam versus ham emails. And um, when you have multi-class classification, um, a, a really useful example is, um, is text classification. So recognizing handwritten characters. And the reason why this is multi-class and not binary is because there are um, 26 letters if you're um, if you're talking about English language and recognizing the characters would uh, mean you would you would look at uh, you would look at the different features within that word that's written and then you would um, you would predict the probability that it is that specific letter and uh, there's multiple there's multiple categories that it could be classified into which is why it's called multi-class classification. And some common algorithms that are used to, um, to solve classification tasks are naive Bayes, Q 
K nearest neighbors, logistic regression, and decision trees. So if you haven't heard of any of these, that's totally okay. We're going to go over Naive Bayes, K nearest neighbors, and logistic regression in this uh, in this workshop and during our demo. And um, decision trees is is um, is also really common, but uh, since we're going to do some other demos with other uh, tasks, we, we probably won't have time for this one today. So the second task you have also within supervised learning <clears throat> is regression. So regression, as we said before, was, um, was finding a relationship between independent and dependent variables. And um, these, these variables tend to be numerical because when you have categorical variables or uh, discrete variables, these are often tough to, uh, these are often really tough to have a um, regression with because you would need to encode the values. So it's the general practice is just to have these um, variables be numerical. So there's different categories, as we said earlier, there's simple regression, which means you're using just one explanatory variable. And then there's multiple regression, which means you're using multiple explanatory variables. And in, in the real world, um, multiple regression is, is way more common because um, you're, you generally don't have just one factor isolated that affects your dependent variable. Oftentimes it's, there's, there's just a whole bunch, of, um, whole bunch of factors that can go, that can be in play for um, affecting a specific uh, dependent variable. Like if we were talking about that house example, it, it may not be just the number of bedrooms that affect the house price. It could be the number of bedrooms, it can be the location. It can also be the, the square footage of the house. It could be the number of bathrooms. So we could think of all of those as explanatory variables. And since there's more than one of those, that would be a multiple regression uh, analysis. So now we have um, different types of models within simple and multiple regression. So there are linear models and there are nonlinear models. So linear models, um, they'll fit a, um, a linear function to the data. And when it's in simple regression, you could think of it as um, one explanatory variable, which could be like the x-axis. And then you can have your dependent variable, which is the y-axis. <clears throat> and when you have linear regression for this, this would be a two-dimensional, um, this would be a two-dimensional line pretty much. But if you had nonlinear senior, a simple regression, this means you're fitting a nonlinear function. And since it's simple regression, there's one explanatory variable and one, um, a one dependent variable. So it would still be a two dimensional graph, but the model would not be linear anymore. So you could have quadratic, um, it could be cubic. So it can be anything that really fits the data. And um, you really, uh, you don't know which model, if it's nonlinear, which will work the best. It's a lot of times it, it depends on the scenario and um, it, it determines, it just depends on your, your knowledge in the field. And a lot of the times it is trial and error first. But then with similar problems, you will see that um, like maybe a quadratic model may be better or an exponential model. So for um, a lot of times for the beginning of a, of a disease, like the, the pandemic we're in, an exponential regression model may be better. But um, if we're talking about the long-term span of a, of a disease, a, a logistic model may be better because it flattens out at the end. So within, so now multiple regression will be using multiple explanatory variables. And what this means is it will actually add dimensionality to the data. So rather than being two dimensional, you're, you're gonna have multiple dimensions. So this is where draw, like visualizing it becomes a little more tricky because uh, it's, it's really tough to, to imagine more than two or three dimensions. Uh, so when you have linear simple or when you have linear multiple regression, you're going to have more than two dimensions, but um, you're, you're going to have a, it's going to be like a plane. So it'll be uh, going through multiple uh, dimensions. And then you have nonlinear, which will be similar. So that one is really nonlinear multiple regression is, is pretty complicated. And we're not going to be going through that in this workshop. So we're going to be going over multiple linear regression. So yeah, so com common algorithms are simple or multiple, linear or nonlinear regression. And then there's lasso regression, which is used for um, dimensionality reduction. And then there's also something called support vector machines. So this is also a very, this is efficient, this is an efficient way to run, um, to run regression that's used in the industry as well. 
so we're just going to be going over multiple linear regression here. Um, but uh, yeah, so a, a, a pattern that you may have already noticed is there's just many categories within categories in machine learning. And that's like, that's a really, that's a really, um, uh, that's, that's just very indicative of machine learning because within machine learning, there's so many different branches and within each branches, within each branch, there's several more branches and every algorithm, they have different ways to do the algorithm as well. So that's just a thing to, to get used to with the machine learning. Like there's, there's just a lot of stuff there. Okay, moving on to the next slide, we have clustering. So clustering was our example of unsupervised learning. So within clustering, there are actually different kinds of, uh, of techniques. So the most simple and common type is centroid based uh, clustering. And this organizes data like non-hierarchically. And what this means is that it just, it just separates the data and uh, puts them into groups or clusters. If it was, um, so another kind was hierarchical. And hierarchical, what it will do is it'll separate them into uh, the data points into groups, but it will also create some trees there to show hierarchy. So it'll show that like one group is the parent of another group and so on and so forth. So hierarchical, um, uh, hierarchical centroid uh, or hierarchical um, clustering is used in different um, scenarios, but centroid based is most common. And then some other kinds are density based and distribution based. Um, clustering. So density-based clustering, what it will do is it connects dense areas together and it will ignore outliers. And uh, distribution-based uh, clustering will cluster data into various probability distributions. And it will uh, it'll identify, it'll, uh, cluster, it'll cluster data based on like the probability that it will be in that distribution. So some uh, some common algorithms that we have in clustering are k-means clustering, mean shift clustering, and these both are centroid based. Then you have db scan, which is density based spatial clustering of applications with noise. Now that's a that's a really uh, long name. Uh, so that one is density based, and then you have Gaussian mixture models, and this one is distribution based, and finally you have agglomerative hierarchical clustering, and that one is an example of hierarchical clustering. So in this, in this demo, or in the demo later, we're going to be using k-means clustering because that's, um, that's a common one that you'll be probably using in your classes. And um, it's, a, it's a bit simpler to learn in a one-hour workshop. So we'll be talking about that one. Okay. So now we're going to be going to our demo portion of this workshop. And uh, so we're going to be talking about Pokemon, and, and uh, that's why we had that Pokédex CSV. And if you're if you're thinking that these Pokemon look really weird, that's because they actually are not Pokemon. So these were um, these were Pokemon created by an artificial intelligence, and uh, these took in features of other Pokemon and generated uh, it generated different Pokemon that uh, it just generated different Pokemon and. They they look really weird because they take they take features from various Pokemon and um, the the AI generates these um, these other ones. So yeah, so moving on to our first demo. So we're going to be talking about naive Bayes. <clears throat> so naive Bayes is commonly used for both binary and multi-class classification. So um, the why it's called naive is because it assumes conditional independence between these predictor variables. And this is really naive because um, it's really unlikely that these predictors are unrelated. So if you're talking about, um, so we're gonna be talking about Pokemon here and the attributes and uh, the attributes that we're gonna be using are like the attack stats, the de defense stats, the, the height, and then like the special attack, the, the hit points and it's highly unlikely that all of these predictors are unrelated, but that's what naive Bayes uh, assumes in its analysis. So that's why this is a good this is a good um, algorithm to just learn because it um, this is this is usually the first one that um, that students learn because it it um, relies on probability and uh, it's it's simpler to understand. But in in practice, this one is not. Um, it's not great because the uh, the assumption of conditional independence is uh, is 
uh, is not good, especially when you have more features. So in our data set, we're going to have many features, which, uh, and that's, that's kind of a hint to, uh, to say that like our, it's, it's gonna be pretty low accuracy. So now we're going to, um, yeah, uh, before we do that, so the way that the way that this algorithm works is that it selects the class whose probability is the highest given those specific features. So we can look down this formula here and the posterior distribution means it's just the probability that your data point has, uh, belongs in this class given its features. So you could think about A as the class and B as all of its features. And uh, it's, a conditional, it's a conditional probability statement. And P of B given A, which means the probability that the, you have that, those features given that class times the probability of um, being in that specific class over the probability of having those features. And oftentimes Bayes rule is used with the law of total probability. And uh, you would calculate all of these posterior distributions and select the one which, which has the highest probability. And then you would classify that data point accordingly. So within naive Bayes itself, there actually are multi several categories. So we will be using Gaussian naive Bayes to, to classify Pokemon types because we have many continuous numerical variables. But um, there's some other naive Bayes algorithms and these include multinomial, complement, Bernoulli, or categorical naive Bayes. And we won't be using categorical naive Bayes because the categorical um, algorithm assumes that all the features are categorical. But our features are, are mostly numerical because we're gonna be using uh, like attack uh, or special attack, special defense stats. And those ones are numerical. Okay, so now we can go ahead and move on to our demo. So I will share my screen to this. Uh, okay, so you should probably see my notebook right now. And if you're following along, that's that's awesome. So yeah, if, if you have trouble following along, just please drop something in the chat and I will, I will look at it and I will address your question. Um, yeah. Okay. So at the top, we just have all of our import statements. And uh, as you can see, we, we have a lot of import statements because um, we're gonna be using scikit-learn for all of these, uh, these algorithms and uh, all of these are in different packages. So we have to, um, we have to install all these different packages. Okay. So this is our Pokédex CSV. And just to explore the CSV real quick, um, there's some different, there's a lot of different attributes that we have. So the different attributes are attack defense, there's height, hit points, and then percentage male. And there's more attack and defense ones, and then there's speed, type, weight, generation, and legendary. And then um, the reason why we chose the index column to be to be a Pokédex number was because the Pokédex number is a unique identifier for all Pokémon. So um, just by knowing just by knowing what the data set was, we we chose that this should be the index column. Okay, and just um, so quick thing here, we have um, we have missing values in this data set, so it's not going to be perfect. And this is a this is a thing that all real data sets have. There's going to be missing values in probably every every data set that you use. So the first thing that we do before um, before using our naive base algorithm is we want to um, we want to deal with this missing data, and so the first the first try that we can do the, the first the first approach that we can use is dropping any column that has any missing value. So to you to do this, we'll use the drop na function, and um, axis equals zero just means we're going to be dropping rows, and how equals any means we'll be dropping any rows that have any um, we'll be dropping all rows that have any missing value. So this Pokemon, Celesteela, it had one missing value, so it'll get dropped. So the thing here is um, we actually lost a lot of data. We lost a lot of data with this line, which is bad because we wanna have more data, especially when um, this, is, this is a pretty small data set. So we would, we would really wanna have as much data as we want, as we can. And another thing that we can notice is that um, when we drop or when we group by um, the legendary Pokemon, we can see that only seven legendaries remain. And this is really, really bad because 
um, if we want to do an analysis on predicting whether something is legendary, we're going to need more legendary Pokemon so we can have a more representative data set. So that's why, um, that's why we should probably try another approach. So we're going to try doing something called data imputation. And we could honestly spend like another, another hour just talking about data imputation, but uh, we're going to be using a simple approach here. So we're going to be using a simple imputer. And uh, all we're going to do is we're going to fill these NAN values with the mean of the column. So whatever, this, uh, whatever the mean of this column is, the percentage male, we're just going to put it into the NAN. So this is, this is a pretty quick and naive um, way to fill, data set, uh, fill your data set, but um, it, it, it's, it's simple, but it's also naive. So in the, in the real world, when you're working with the data set, you would want to use, um, you'd want to maybe use K nearest neighbors to, uh, yeah, you'd want to use K nearest neighbors to impute the, the missing values. So we're just going to fill, um, we're just going to fill in these values with the mean. And um, the way that you can do this is we first make this simple imputer object, and then you, um, you identify these missing values as the NAN values. And your strategy is going to be using the mean to, um, to, fill, to fill in the mean for any, uh, any values that are missing. And since the imputer only works on numerical data, we're just going to query the uh, numerical columns, and then we're going to fit and transform our data set. So after this, all of our data is going to be there. So there's nothing missing. And then we can transform it uh, into, we can, just, we can just make it into a data frame. And after that, we're just going to assign it back into our original Pokédex column because we want to uh, continue using that one because it had um, other columns as well, like type is legendary and name. So yeah, so now we get to start with naive base. So uh, as I said earlier, yeah, naive Bayes, what, it, what it's used for is classification. And our goal in this demo is to use Gaussian naive, naive Bayes to classify some Pokemon types. So the first thing we're gonna do is, uh, is encode the data because we have some categorical variables in type. So we wanna encode the types as, um, we wanna encode those categorical variables, which are types as, uh, as numerical variables. So as you can see here, um, the types were like grass, fire, water, steel. We wanna change those into numbers because that's what um, the naive Bayes algorithm, you need to do that for that. So once we encode those values, we will just assign those values back in and we can drop the old type, the old type column because we don't, it's, it's, it's gonna be really tough to use um, strings. So we need to encode those values into integers. And after that, I just made a quick table here, which identifies the Pokemon type from the encoded number. So um, yeah, these, these uh, like, like the, if it was 10, it would be the um, ground type. So this table will show you the corresponding uh, Pokemon type for the encoded number. Okay, so after that, we're gonna be doing feature selection. So what feature selection does is you can select what features are going to be put into your into your um, into your algorithm, and you're going to be uh, you're going to be specifying what you want to predict. So X capital X is your data frame with all of your features, and uh, Y is your predict uh, Y is what you want to predict, and this should be a series or an array. So um, yeah. So then we want what we want to do is we want to randomly partition this data set into training data set and then testing data set. And the convention is we usually want to have 70% um, be for training and 30% of the data set be for testing. And uh, what we do is we use this really useful class that we're going to keep using in this demo. We're going to be using the train test split method. And what it does is it takes in your, it takes in your data set, which we, saw, which we made before. And then it takes your, um, what you want to predict and it'll actually split it into 70, 30. So it'll split it into the proportions that you specify. So after doing this partition, we can see that it randomly selects 70% of the data set to be your training and then 30% to be your testing. And then, uh, yeah, and then it's the same thing for the, same thing for the Y. 
So I just showed the X here, but the same thing for the Y. So it'll have the corresponding true values for the, for the X train and X test. So now we're gonna be doing um, Gaussian naive Bayes. So what we're gonna use is a Gaussian naive Bayes object, and we're going to fit that on our trained, on our training data. So this here is our first parameter has our inputs, and then our second parameter has our outputs. And since this was supervised learning, we're feeding it in the correct outputs. And after that, what we do is we want to um, predict our outputs based on our uh, based on our x test. So based on our testing inputs. So we will do this, and we can see what the accuracy is. And we got around 8.7%, which is really, really, really bad. So this data frame will actually, uh, since we actually knew what our true um, test output should have been, which is the observed column, we can compare what we got, uh, what we got from our algorithm, which is predicted, to what should have actually, what we actually should have gotten. And we can see that a lot of this is really is really off, and this is due to um, this is due to that naive assumption of of predictors being unrelated. So there are there are many better um, there's there's definitely better algorithms for classification, but naive Bayes is just the one that we use because it's um, it's a little simple to start off with. Okay, so moving on to our next section, we're going to be going over um, we're going to be going over k-means or k-nearest neighbors. Okay, so you should I think you should be able to see my screen. Uh, can someone just put a thumbs up if you can see my slides? The code screen or the slides? The slides. Yeah. We're awesome. Seeing right okay. Now. Cool. Okay, so now we're going to be going over k nearest neighbors. So this is also a classification algorithm. So this one is used for both binary and multi-class classification. And uh, naive Bayes will also use for both. But a side note is that it's also used for regression, but um, it's, it's a little less common for regression. But in regression, all it would do is you would just value um, for that data point, you would be, its value would just be the average of the k nearest neighbors. So in the classification port, uh, version of k nearest neighbors, all we do is we just take the majority class of the k nearest neighbors. So that k in the beginning of the algorithm just stands for the k that, uh, the number of neighbors that you'll be looking at. So, it, and, and neighbors just means data points, the closest data points. And you often choose k by a trial and error. So you don't really know what's best until you actually try it out. And low values of k may be subject to outliers because um, if, you have, if you have one point that's, if its nearest neighbor is an outlier, then uh, it'll classify it as an outlier and sort of make, um, it, then you'll be, you'll be having more data points classified as outliers. And higher values of k um, can lead you to miss smaller clusters. So if we had one small cluster and we used, um, it, it was pretty dense, a small cluster, but we used a high value of K, there'd be more data points from other clusters that would uh, lead you to miss this smaller cluster and you would be classifying it as another cluster. So those are some things with the K value that you need to be careful about. Um, yeah. And then when you have more features there, there's a problem with uh, overfitting, which means it learns, it, it just follows the data too well. And then when you use other data, unseen data, it may not uh, classify as well. Okay, so now let's move on to the, um, the demo for k nearest neighbors. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do one with binary classification and we're gonna predict legendary Pokemon, uh, like whether a Pokemon is legendary or not. And then we're going to predict the Pokemon types. And that'll be an example of multi-class classification. Okay, so I'm going to shift over to my uh, to my Jupyter notebook once again, and feel free to do the same on your computer. Okay, so our first demo is going to be with binary classification, and this is predicting whether um, whether a Pokemon is legendary or not. So we just just looking back at this this data frame. These are going to be our features. Everything except um, uh, name and uh, is legendary because is legendary is our target. So that's what we want to predict. And we're going to be using everything else to, uh, to help that those are gonna be our features that we use to predict that target value. And we're gonna use the same thing here. So we're gonna use train test split because that's an extremely common operation. 
uh, because it randomly splits our data set into a training and testing portion. And the only different thing we're gonna do here is we're going to try on different K values and we're going to see which one gives us the best accuracy. So the format within each algorithm is, is pretty similar. So you, you create the object and then you fit it based on your training data and then you predict it on your testing data. And then you can um, run some metrics to compare your testing data to your predict predicted data if it's uh, supervised learning. So as you can see here, our accuracy was actually much, much higher. So um, yeah, so in this, in this case, so when I ran it last time, it'll change every time. So when K was equal to five, it had the best, best results. But this time when K was equal to 20, that had the best results. But um, oftentimes, if you use a high K, you might be, you might be overfitting. So we can just try it out with, um, we can just show what the observed versus predicted were with um, the K equal to five. So we're just gonna copy this code again since we didn't store it as a variable. And we will be able to see what we had predicted versus observed for our testing data. So I think for the most part, since this one had an accuracy of 93.7%, that's a really high accuracy for a machine learning algorithm. Um, for the most part, it will, be, uh, it will be really accurate. So for this first value, it, it missed it. It predicted it was legendary, which is what the one means, when it actually was not. And then um, for the other ones that we have in our in our uh, little preview here, it it's it it got them right, but um, yeah. So it, overall, this one had a pretty high accuracy. So now moving on, we're going to be doing multi-class classification, and we're going to be doing the same problem that we did before with naive Bayes. So let's um, let's do the same thing here. So our features are going to be the same as they were before with naive Bayes, and uh, our target is going to be the type. Uh, encoded. So it's going to be that, uh, whether it's like fire, water, but it's going to be uh, an integer. And now we're just going to um, do the train test split once again. And because I don't want to get get variables confused, I just named them KNN2 because it's the second demo of KNN. And yeah, it's a similar process here. And what we can see here is um, the the accuracy is a little lower here. It's it's 22%, which is not not good. Uh, so that means there are better algorithms to, to deal with uh, multi-class classification. So some of those could be like decision trees or, um, or random forest classifiers, because those are, those, um, those are more complex and they, they, they take into account the relationship between the variables as well. So uh, yeah, we can just see how our, how our um, multi-class classification did versus on the test data set. So um, it had, with k equals 10, it had an accuracy of about 20%, 21%. So it got one in five correct, which is not really what we want. So um, yeah, it got this one correct, but then a lot of the other ones, it, it got incorrect. So that's why these, these are the algorithms that you generally use while, while learning. But then um, in the industry, they use more complex ones that are proven to be more, um, they're more efficient and they have a higher accuracy. So th those ones will, um, will be better with larger data sets. Okay, so moving on to our next section, we're gonna be talking about uh, logistic regression. So let me shift back to my slides. Okay. Cool, okay, so we're gonna be talking about logistic regression. So although this says regression, it's actually used for binary classification. And that's kind of weird thinking about it. it. But the reason why is it actually predicts whether a discrete variable is true or false. And uh, it, it, true or false can be um, denoted with like binary or uh, it can be binary. So one could be, one could be true and zero is false. And um, this is a regression technique. So it fits a, it fits, um, fits a curve, which is what regression is, but it's actually used for classification. And what this does is it fits an S-shaped curve or a sigmoid function to the, to the graph. And the curve will tell you the probability of uh, that discrete variable taking that particular value. So if, if, I, have a, if I have a data point, um, if I have a data point around here, it's closer to zero. So it's less than 50%. So that's more likely that it's not legendary. 
if I have one that's here, it's closer to um, one. So we would classify it as a legendary Pokemon. So yeah, and the way that it works behind the scenes is it, it uses maximum likelihood. And maximum likelihood is, um, is just a way to, uh, it, it calculates multiple sigmoid functions and it calculates what has the maximum probability of being, uh, of, of being in that class. So we're gonna be doing a, a demo on multiple logistic regression because we're using multiple features. And what we're gonna do is again, use the same, uh, we're gonna have the same end goal as before, predicting the legendary Pokemon. Okay, so back to this demo, we wanna predict whether something is legendary or not. And uh, our first step as always is that pre-processing. So we select what are our features. And once again, we have the same features and our is legendary is our, um, is our target. And we're gonna be using logistic regression. So all of our variables have log at the end. And this is the partitioning step. And then now we're going to be creating the object, fitting it on our training, and then predicting it based on our test, um, based on our testing portion. So now we're gonna be doing something a little bit different. And um, this is because we have binary classification. So what we can do is we can build a confusion matrix. So what a confusion matrix does is it will tell you what the true positives were, which is 218, it's the top left. It'll tell you what the true negatives were, which is the bottom right. So that diagonal will tell you what the true, what the true values were. And then it'll tell you, um, this will be the false positives. So you had one false positive and you had one, or you had 10 false negatives. So uh, confusion matrices are, are used to, they're used behind the scenes for these accuracy scores. And uh, yeah, so if, uh, if someone in the chat could, uh, you could either say it out loud or put in the chat, can you see a relationship between the accuracy score and the confusion matrix? So if you, yeah, if you so, know, yeah. Yeah, so that's the yeah, true positive plus true negative. So 218 plus 12 divided by like all four of them, right? Yeah, exactly. So if you take 212 plus 200, or sorry, 218 plus 12 divided by the total, you're gonna get the accuracy score. So you're exactly right. And um, there's two other metrics that we don't, we haven't had here, but I'm just gonna talk about them. So there's one called precision. So accuracy and precision are, are often mixed up, but um, what accuracy means is it's the ratio of correct ones over the total. And precision just means how, uh, precision means like how close together your predictions are. And using the confusion matrix, this would be the, um, the ratio of all your correct positives, so your true positives over your total positives. So what this means is it would be your true positives, which is in this case, it's 218 divided by your true positives plus false positives. So that would be 218 plus one. So that's your precision. And then you have something called recall, which is called the true positive rate. And it's also called sensitivity. And what this does is it calculates the ratio of your correct positive predictions to the total positive examples. Um, so this would be your, um, this could be your total positives, which is uh, once again, 218, um, plus your, or over your total positives plus false negatives. So this is all of, so this is the true positives over all of the things that you called positive. So this would be 218 over 218 plus 10. And that would be, once again, it would be a true positive rate. So these are all different metrics that, um, that are used to analyze your, your uh, data set. And uh, oftentimes you, it depends on your scenario, like which one you would want to use. Um, but yeah, you can, you can often use like all, all three of them if you want. And we're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna be comparing our, our um, observed values to our predicted ones. And our accuracy here was, it was, was really, is quite good. So it's 95.4%. So for the most part, this one was a really strong algorithm. Okay. And uh, I guess we can see that um, binary classification is, is often easier than multi-class classification. And that's just, it's a little intuitive because um, 
uh, it's easier to classify things into two categories than it is into several different categories. So that's why for um, for multi-class classifications, you, you often need to use um, more uh, more efficient and like uh, more complex algorithms. And uh, yeah, so since this is just an introduction, we won't be going over it right now, but maybe in the future, we can definitely go over that. So the next algorithm we have is uh, is our first regression one. So I'm gonna be going back to the desktop. So this is linear regression. And this is used for a regression task, which means you're predicting that continuous variable um, based on your explanatory variables. And your output is going to be continuous and your slope is constant for linear regression. And when you have multiple regression, the difference is that um, it's going to be in multiple dimensions because you have different attributes. And uh, the way that you're, instead of having slopes, you have weights. So the weight will tell you how, um, how much the, um, how much that attribute uh, contributes to that de dependent variable. And when you normalize the weights, then you can see um, exactly how, uh, how well related one, how well correlated one, um, uh, one attribute is to the to dependent variable. And instead of using maximum likelihood, what this uses is, is least squares regression. So it calculates the, um, the error for each point and uh, it makes an, a least squares regression line and whichever line reduces, minimizes the error will be your regression line. So now we're gonna do a quick demo uh, on um, using multiple linear regression since you have multiple attributes to predict the hit points, um, which is how much damage a Pokemon can take before it faints. So, okay, so we're gonna be doing this again. So our features are going to be everything but HP. We're gonna be doing train test split once again. And now we're gonna be using a linear regression object and then fit it, fit it based on the training data and then predict it on the testing data. And now we have different kinds of errors. So we have mean absolute error, mean squared error and root mean squared error. So yeah, so these are all different metrics that you use for regression. And um, yeah, so you generally like the, the median is used to, to minimize the mean absolute error and then the mean is used to, uh, to minimize the mean squared error. But um, yeah, it depends like when you're, when you're working when you're working on a project, you'll decide like which, which metric is the best to use. And uh, yeah, so the, yeah, the mean absolute error is less, is more resistant to outliers and the mean squared error is less resistant to outliers. And we can once again, compare our observed, observed hit points to our predicted ones. And we can see for some values like this one, it was, it was sort of close. And then this one is really far off. Um, but then for this one, it was, it was really, really accurate. Okay. All right, uh, moving on to our last demo, we're going to be talking about k-means clustering. So this one is our first, so k-means clustering is our first unsupervised uh, machine learning uh, algorithm. And this is not to be confused with k-nearest neighbors. So the, all the names sound very similar, it's, we, need to, we need to draw them apart from each other. They, they don't have anything to do with one another. So K nearest neighbors was for classification, but K means clustering is for clustering. And what this does is you actually don't have the outputs here. What it does is it, it finds groups within, its, within the data that best category, uh, it just finds groups based on centroids. And um, it'll find these groups within the data. So it'll be an iterative process and it'll keep, um, keep recorrecting itself. So it'll start off by initializing K centroids, often randomly, or you can preset them. So it depends on what, um, it's generally gonna be random, but uh, it, it depends, on, uh, depends on what you want to do. And then what you wanna do is you wanna fix the centroids while assigning points to the closest centroid. So what this does is use the Euclidean distance with, um, with multiple attributes and it's just the, the distance formula and you figure out um, which centroid is the closest to each point. And then you classify that point in to that, you, you tie that point to that centroid and uh, when it has like the smallest distance 
and then um, that's the assigning the points to the closest centroid. And then you fix the groups while assigning new centroids. And the new centroids are going to be the mean of the groups. So it's, it's like the multidimensional mean of all of those um, data points. And then once you have that, you're going to be going back to step number two, which is fixing the centroids while um, assigning the points to the closest centroid. So this will be an iterative process. And this image on the right kind of shows that. It, um, it shows that like your, your centroids will change and then your groups will change and then your centroids will change again, and then your groups will change. And at the end, it's gonna reach a condition called convergence. And convergence is when you have your, your maximum, you can either set, you can either reach your maximum um, number of iterations or your centroids won't move. So you have like a tolerance set where um, if it's smaller than that, you, um, you exit this algorithm or if your groups don't change that much after several iterations. Yeah, and uh, also k-means clustering is used for numerical inputs only because calculating the distance requires numbers. And uh, in this demo, we're going to be using uh, clustering, we're gonna be clustering attack and defense points. So with, um, with k-means clustering, it's, it's really difficult to visualize more attributes because um, it adding attributes as dimensions and um, so we just chose we just chose attack and defense points because um, uh, those might be interesting to, to see if there's any clusters within the within the Pokemon. Okay. So moving on to uh, this demo here. So our features that we chose were attack and defense, and uh, what we want to do is we want to change this um, this data into a NumPy array because that's what the k-means clustering needs. Um, and then we create the object and our k, which is the, the k in k-means clustering, our k is three. And then we said that we want to initialize it by random. And then uh, these are the number of iterations that we set. And then our maximum iterations is, is uh, 300. So it'll converge um, if it goes more than 300 iterations or like right at 300 or if the tolerance is, uh, or if the centroids don't change by less than this, or if the centroids change by less than uh, this much to so the tolerance. And then, uh, yeah, so then what you do is we wanna fit, we wanna fit the data to the uh, numerical data that we had above. And we're going to get this, this, array, is, uh, this array here. And then we're just gonna plot um, each of the groups separately. And then, um, we will just plot the centroids and we can show that show it all on one graph together. So what we have here is we have three centroids, one here, one here, and one here. And this shows that these are three distinct groups. And as you can see, there's one drawback of this algorithm. So what it does is it, it actually incorporates these outliers. So these, this outlier here, it had a very low attack point, but super high defense. And since it was actually closer to this, this centroid than any of the other ones, it classified it in this group. So that's actually a drawback of k-means clustering because um, it won't just like throw away outliers or it won't like flag them for you. It, that's why it's not really good for anomaly detection. Um, it will, it'll actually like think that the outlier is normal. It'll think that it's par part of a specific group. So yeah, so I think um, that was our last demo and Yes, yeah, so that was our last demo. And if you have any questions, feel free to just unmute yourself or um, put it in the chat. And I hope you enjoy this, this cartoon at the very end. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us today.